Number 12. What information can you use to predict whether a bond between two atoms is covalent or ionic? Okay, so remember what the general definitions of whether an atom is a covalent molecule, or when two atoms come together, whether they're covalent molecules or if they're ionic compounds. Covalent molecules come about when you have two or more nonmetals interacting with each other. And the nonmetals here are all in blue, all right? So this uh, periodic table right here is a modified version. It's not the full periodic table. Um, I'll tell you why I chose this one in just a little bit. But if you have compounds between just nonmetals, so any of this blue stuff, and don't forget about hydrogen, it will be a covalent compound. So, for example, I can have water. Water would be a covalent compound or a covalent molecule. Remember, molecules can only be covalent, not ionic. Um, we have, I don't know, sugar, right? C, um, C6H12O6. That consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they're all nonmetals. Ionic compounds, on the other hand, are between a metal and a nonmetal. So that's one criteria. So you have to have a metal and you have to have a nonmetal, respectively. Remember, no two metals can come together. So uh, sodium cannot react or come together with potassium to try to make a ionic um, compound. It's just not going to happen. So you need a metal and you need a nonmetal. So that's like with table salt. The metal is sodium and the nonmetal is chlorine. And together they make NaCl when they come together. Second thing that we need to know uh, in order to be an ionic compound is if you have two polyatomics. Now, I didn't put the polyatomics here. I didn't think it was really that important, but you guys should know your polyatomics. That's like your phosphate, your carbonate, your ammonium ions. So ammonium is NH4+. Plus, and if you reacted that polyatomic with another polyatomic, let's just say carbonate, which is CO3 2 minus, that would form an ionic bond. And ionic bonds always have a distinct positive and a distinct negative with them. So when, going back to this example, when sodium and chlorine come together, sodium has a distinct positive, plus one, and chlorine has that negative one. But when you come together, when nonmetals come to, together to form a covalent molecule, they don't have those direct charges. Okie dokie. So that's one thing. What information would you need? Well, the first thing we would need is what type of atoms are they, right? Are they two nonmetals? Are they one metal, one nonmetal, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing that we would need. What specific type of atom, what element on the periodic table is it? Because then we can figure out whether it's covalent or ionic. The second thing I want to say is you can tell if a uh, molecule is covalent or if a compound is ionic by the electronegativity numbers. So that's another thing that we would need, the electronegativity negativity. I think it's, yeah, values we'll say. So that's why I bring up this chart over here. There's two different types of covalent bonds in a covalent molecule. There's a pure covalent and a polar covalent type of bond. If the two atoms that came together have a electronegativity difference, means subtraction, right? All, you're, all you basically do is just subtract the two electronegative values from the two atoms. And if that difference is less than 0.4, it would be covalent, and it would be classified as a covalent bond. Here, if it's between 0.4 and 1.8, it's polar covalent, but still it's a covalent bond. And then um, if it's ionic, it would be greater than 1.8. So let me give you an example of that. Let's just say that I have um, H coming together with O. So there's a bond here, right? And then we'll say C coming together with H. 
and then we'll do the NACL, right? Let's just say that NA, and just for lack of um, representation, I'm going to just put a line here, bond, but technically there is no bond here. So maybe I will just put the positive and the negative. Okay. So now, what is the electronegative numbers that hydrogen has and that oxygen has? Well, hydrogen is over here. Electronegative number is 2.1. And oxygen is 3.5, right? And by the way, these numbers, these like integer values, you know, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then, you know, with their decimals, this is their electronegativity values. The term electronegativity just basically means how well you attract an electron in a certain bond. So if you have a high electronegativity, I'll just put EN, that means that you will pull electrons towards you or towards the atom, all right? So high numbers means that the electrons in the certain bond gets pulled more towards you. You're basically more greedy. So between hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen has a way higher electronegativity value, which means that the electrons here, if I actually drew this out, let's just say that this was the, the bond. And remember, for every bond, there's two electrons, right? It wouldn't be evenly split. What's going to happen is these electrons get pulled more closer to the one that has a higher electronegativity. So oxygen is basically grabbing those electrons more firmly than hydrogen would. So that's what electronegativity tells you. In the certain bond, who has the electrons more close to it? And it's always the one that has the higher number. So if I subtracted these two, 3.5 minus 2.1... I get 1.4. And remember, electronegativity is always going to be a positive number. So if you did 2.1 minus 3.5, just take the um, absolute value. So this would be 1.4. And 1.4 is between 0.4 and 1.8. So that's why this bond, H and O, would be a polar covalent bond. You would do the same thing for these other guys. So carbon and hydrogen, carbon's electronegativity is 2.5. Hydrogen's is 2.1, just like before. So when you subtract these, you only get a 0 0.4 electronegativity difference. Now, technically, I would have to actually go back here because they're saying that polar covalent is between 0.4 and 1.8. This is from your textbook, but a lot of textbooks actually say that a CH bond is actually a nonpolar covalent bond. But going off of this, it would fall into this type of bracket. But you, you see what the deal is here. And then for sodium with chlorine, sodium is 0.9, and chlorine is, where is it, 3. So when they form that quote-unquote ionic bond, chlorine is going to take all of the electrons all for itself, right? Because the electronegativity difference is just way too great. That's why it's an ionic bond. So this would be 2.1, and there it is. So you just have to know two things. You could know the different atoms, and then you can find out which one is covalent or ionic, or if you know the electronegativity values, you can also do it from there. And that basically checks out this question, all right? So hopefully this helped. So remember the trend of electronegativity. We will be going into that later in this chapter. So just know that as you go from left to right, you increase electronegativity, and as you go top to bottom, you decrease electronegativity. But we'll talk about that more in the next questions, all right? So thanks for tuning in. If you wouldn't mind, hit subscribe. If you like this video, give it a like, and I'll see you guys all in the next question. Bye-bye.